Good morning, Grace Church. My name is Tao Chen. It's a great privilege for me to be here. Thank you, Elder Thomas, for inviting me to speak today. Today, I will be addressing the topic of how to make the church a safer place for those who experience same-sex attraction. This is increasingly the trending topic of the day, especially for our youth and young adults, but also for our church and for our nation. So thank you for trusting me to address this very sensitive subject with you. But first, let me introduce myself with some pictures. I am, a, an, I am an assistant pastor at 316 Church in Singapore, serving in the young adults ministry. I'm also a Bible school instructor. I also serve in several ministries, including True Love Is under 316 Church, which raises awareness in the LGBT space. And I also serve at Choices under Church of Our Saviour, which ministers to those who experience same-sex attraction. Prior to, serving in bank, uh, prior to serving in ministry, I worked in the marketplace for 25 years, mostly as a banker. I serve in ministry now, but only seven years ago, I was still addicted to gay sex and gay porn. You see, from as early as when I was seven years old, I knew that I was attracted to the same sex. I was not given a questionnaire at any time to choose whether I wanted to be attracted to the same sex or to the opposite sex. I just knew that I was attracted to the same sex. I say this because I've met some Christians who assume that same-sex attraction is something that some of us choose to feel, and therefore this is something that we could stop feeling if only we choose to. This is not true. In fact, extensive research in the past informs us that most people experience little or no sense of choice about their sexual orientation. The answer is therefore not just to turn straight by dating girls, by getting married, by having kids and so on, as if this is a light switch that we could choose to turn on or off. So please do not be mistaken on this. Personally, I had a wonderful childhood. I was not a victim of negligent parenting. I was not a victim of childhood trauma or of inappropriate childhood sexual advances. But many others who experienced same-sex attraction were such victims. However, as far as I'm aware, there is no conclusive scientific proof that such parenting deficiencies or adverse childhood experiences cause same-sex attraction. I'm saying this because it is important to relieve parents of those who experience same-sex attraction from such guilt and condemnation. And it is equally important for children not to hold this against their parents. There is also no conclusive scientific proof that same-sex attraction is genetically coded. So this is not a question of nature either. And for me, this attraction to the same sex did not stop even after I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was a teenager. Here I've been asked before, is same-sex attraction a spiritual oppression, a spiritual possession, or even the result of demonic spirits at work? As far as I'm aware, in the vast majority of cases, the answer is no. And there is no empirical, there is no scriptural evidence that spiritual deliverance is the answer to same-sex attraction in every case. So please do not be mistaken on this too. So if same-sex attraction is not a choice, if it is not because of nature, not because of nurture, if it's not because of demonic spirits at work, then how do we explain same-sex attraction? Did God create some of us this way? The answer is absolutely not. James tells us, do not be deceived, for every good and perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. This means God did not give some of us good gifts and then afflict others of us with same-sex attraction in some twisted double-mindedness. No. Same-sex attraction is simply a product of the fall of mankind, a corruption that afflicts all mankind. The Bible tells us that we are all broken from the corruption of the fall of mankind, but just in different ways. Some of us happen to be broken in experiencing same-sex attraction, but others of us are broken in other ways. 
For example, some are afflicted by the desire for adultery, others by the desire for porn, and yet others by the weakness for wrath, and some by the desire for drunkenness, and so on. Now, obviously, from all your blank faces, clearly none of you have any idea what I just said. So these scriptures must be talking about other Christians in Kuching, but not at BEM Grace. But no, God did not afflict me this way. He did not create me this way. When I search scripture, it seems clear to me that it is the corruption of the fall of mankind that afflicted me this way. We do not get to choose which brokenness we experience, but we do get to choose how we deal with the brokenness that we experience. And sadly for me, in my early 20s, I chose to explore the gay circle partly out of my sexual desire, but partly also out of loneliness and a desire to connect. And when I did, I was so relieved to find that the gay circle was generally a community where I felt safe for the first time, in a sense that I was not judged, condemned, or ostracized by them, where I felt understood, accepted, and where I felt I belong. And this was in stark contrast to the church or to Christians then, where I did not think I would even be welcome let alone understood or accepted. Now this we need to do better as the body of Christ, and I will explain how later. Sadly for me, this relief of welcome and acceptance in the gay circle quickly spiraled into a carnal sinkhole that I became addicted to. For as I started to club and party away in that circle, I also started to hook up with guys on one night stands, and before long I was seriously addicted to gay sex many times having sex with multiple guys in the same day. This is not the case of every person who experiences same-sex attraction, but I was so addicted that I ended up having sex with hundreds, maybe even thousands of guys. I wasn't counting. However, after every encounter of gay sex, I would feel empty inside. I'd feel unfulfilled and unsatisfied. Yes, there was great pleasure in each encounter, but it was temporary. Then the emptiness would return, and there was a void inside me that did not get filled. Instead, the more sex I had, the bigger this void grew. Then one day in 2014, a friend of mine told me that he was going to church that Sunday. I said to my friend that I was too dirty to go to church, but what he said next shocked me. He said, no, on the contrary, I am righteous before God because I had received Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was a teenager. It was so strange to hear him say this, that I followed him to this church out of sheer curiosity to find out whether this was truly so or not. Now, I know this picture looks rather similar to the previous one, but whilst the previous experience fed my flesh, the Word of God that was preached at this church for the first time fed my spirit inside me, the void that was inside me. Just like Psalms 42 says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul, O God, for you. So I kept returning to this church again and again, hooked to the Word of God. But at the same time, I was also still rushing to the gay sauna right after service every Sunday, hooked to gay sex for the rest of the day. I was torn between the two. It was so strange, and I did not know how to deal with this until one Sunday almost a year later, The pastor preached on the parable of the prodigal son. As the prodigal son made his way home, the Bible says in Luke chapter 15, that when the son was still a long way off, the father ran to the son, not the other way around. And when he got to the son, it was the father who fell on the son's neck, kissed him, and put the best robe on the son. And then the pastor pointed this out, which blew me away. The father did this when the son was still filthy, Like this, having just returned from feeding swine, penniless and homeless, and not after the son had cleaned himself up first. I've met homeless people before, and they're not the ones that I would want to run to, let alone kiss or put my best robes on. But that was exactly what this father did. It was as if God was saying to me, I know you've been running off to the gay sauna right after service every church Sunday, but just come home, son. Come home just as you are. This love of God broke my heart for him, 
and brought me to tears for years to come every time I recount that encounter. As I started to walk with God again from that moment on, I sought God for answers on this same-sex attraction that I experienced. Why me? Is this from God? What am I supposed to do with this? And then I discovered that God indeed had answers for me, even truths that would set me free, and they were all in the Bible. So I started to devour the Word of God for these answers. As I worked through and as I walked out these answers for myself, on the 6th of June 2018, after years of intense struggle and countless setbacks, I finally broke free from the grip of same-sex attraction that had kept me under addiction to gay sex for nearly 30 years. Not by might, nor by power, but by His Spirit. Praise God. And the good news is this. The same freedom of God is available to everyone and anyone else who desires it and who seeks Him in faith and with patience because there's no partiality with God. Now, just to be clear, this does not mean that I no longer experience attraction to the same sex. I still experience attraction to the same sex now. But overcoming is not the suppression of the desire. It is not necessarily even the absence of the desire, but it is the victory, the ability and the strength to overcome the desire. So now, whilst I still experience attraction to the same sex, the difference is that I'm now no longer unable to overcome such desires and temptations unlike before. This is the same type of victory that even Jesus himself experienced when he was here on earth. Because the Bible says that he too was tempted in every way as we are, but yet without sin. So just as Jesus was not immune from temptations, but was victorious over them, so too is the victory that we must experience, even though we may still continue to experience the attraction to the same sex. Now, when I speak about the churches, a common question that is often asked is this, how can we Christians understand and relate better to those who experience same-sex attraction? Well, we should first be aware that the LGBT community is not one ubiquitous community. There are four very different constituents to the community. Firstly, there are the overcomers on the top right-hand quadrant of this chart. These are, for example, Christians who want to and who have experienced the power of God to overcome their LGBT desires. Then there are the strugglers, the bottom right-hand quadrant of this chart, who are, for example, Christians who are still working and walking out the answers to their struggle. Both of these quadrants on the right here are minorities. By far, the vast majority of the LGBT community are the moderates, the bottom left-hand quadrant of this chart. They are those who are in the lifestyle and who want to stay in the lifestyle by choice. Some are Christians. Some may even be in church, but they also want to stay in the lifestyle. And then there are the activists, the top left-hand quadrant of this chart. They are also a minority, but they dominate the public square with their loudness and their fierceness to such an extent that they are discipling the world and even parts of the church today with their ideology, especially in the absence of the voice of the rest of the church. So four very distinct quadrants in the LGBT community. It is a mistake, therefore, to assume that the LGBT community is all the same and that we should relate to them in exactly the same way. For example, it is a grave mistake to address the entire LGBT community as if they are all activists with an agenda because the vast majority of the community are clearly not activists. It is equally grave a mistake to assume that the entire LGBT community struggles with same-sex attraction and that they want our help on this. This is a mistake because this is highly offensive to the moderates who comprise the vast majority of the LGBT community and to the activists because they think we need help, not them. I know because I've lived for almost 30 years as a moderate, over two and a half years as a struggler and now as an overcomer. So I speak from lived personal experience on this. 
So how then should we relate to the LGBT community? Well, we need to match our response to the constituent that we are addressing. For example, with the overcomers, we should celebrate their testimony and exhort them to serve. With strugglers, we should welcome them and journey with them. With moderates, especially those who are in church and who want to stay in church, we should accept them into our community and take time to understand them. And with activists, we should learn to understand their points, but to stand with God on points of difference. But how do we welcome, accept, and understand overcomers, strugglers, and even moderates who want to seek God in our midst? Well, one answer is cats. Cats. Kuching. Where we are right now. Cats, which stands for companionship, answers, testimony, and supplication. So firstly, companionship. This means being a trusted friend who accepts those who want to walk with God in the space of same-sex attraction as they are, instead of rejecting them until they've cleaned up their lives first. But what does this acceptance and companionship look like in practice? Perhaps these three handles will help. Firstly, this means taking the time even over the long haul of years to understand those who experience same-sex attraction. Build trust and credibility with them and do life together with them in a culture of community, irrespective of where they are in their journey with God on same-sex attraction. Now, let me clarify up front. Acceptance does not mean agreeing with, affirming, or celebrating a choice of lifestyle that is contrary to God's design. No. But it does mean not rejecting from our community even those who are still torn to the gay lifestyle but who also want to figure out with God how to deal with their gay lifestyle. People like me, in my first year when I returned to church, when I was still torn to gay sex right after service every Sunday, but when I was also hooked to the Word of God and trying to figure out how to make sense of what answers the Word of God has for me. This is a picture of one of our services at my church, 316 in Singapore. And here, our young adult leaders were playing board games together on a Saturday night at one of our homes. And here, one of our home churches was having a picnic together in public. You might ask, why am I showing you these pictures? What is so special about them? You do the same in your own church. But in every one of these pictures that I've just shown you, at least one in each picture experiences same-sex attraction. And there are even others in our church who are still struggling with how to deal with their weakness for gay sex. And we know that. But as you can see, we don't put a tag around them. We don't spotlight them. And we certainly don't ring-fence them away from the rest of the church. Instead, as you have seen, we just do regular life together with them in a culture of community. In addition, a culture of community is one that goes the distance together with each other, even if some are not walking with God in some area of their life. Now, don't get me wrong, our heart is for all to walk with God in every area of their life all the time. But if some are not, instead of keeping them at arm's length, instead of abandoning them, instead of threatening them, let's resolve to do life together with them as a community valuing them, looking out for them, being there for them just as any friend would. Not everyone, even those whose heart is for God, is always victorious in the area of same-sex attraction all the time. A couple of years ago on a Friday night, a young guy whom I was ministering to called me and he wanted to talk. He had just picked up a stranger from a gay app and invited the stranger to his home. They were in his bedroom together and they were taking their clothes off for sex when the other guy, for no reason, changed his mind and left. The young guy that I was ministering to was so shaken by how close he got to a sexual encounter with this guy that he called me to talk about it. I did not rebuke him. I did not send him down a guilt trip. 
instead I looked to the Holy Spirit on how to respond and I said to the young guy, hey buddy, I do not rejoice that you invited this guy to your room, but I do rejoice that you did not go through with it. I also rejoice that you called me about it immediately. I rejoice because you made a decision to run back to God instead of run away from Him. In fact, all heaven rejoices with your choice of response here. The Bible says, run to the throne of grace for mercy and grace to help in time of need. God wants us to run to Him even when we have messed up. Otherwise, why would we need mercy from the throne of grace? I told this young guy, God has a way out for you on this. Next Friday night, I messaged him to encourage him. And he replied saying, don't worry about him because God had indeed shown him a way out on how to deal with this after that night. And it was as simple as this. Don't be alone on Friday night. So from that Friday night on, he would continue to surround himself with his cell group or other friends. And he's done well since. So do you see there is power in a culture of community? The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 26, five of you chase a hundred, but a hundred of you shall put even 10,000 to flight. There is great power in a culture of community. Secondly, this acceptance in companionship is also about walking the talk, that it is safe to come out and come home to God in the body of Christ. One way to do this is to elevate those who experience same-sex attraction but who want to walk with God on this to serve and even to lead in our midst. I was so inspired when my senior pastor asked me to serve as an assistant pastor in my church despite my background. And I'm not alone in my church. Joseph, another overcomer who experiences same-sex attraction, also serves as worship leader and as youth leader in our church, and there are others beyond him in our church. This is a powerful way to demonstrate acceptance in companionship in the body of Christ. Another way to walk the talk that it is safe to come out and come home to God in the body of Christ is to celebrate in our own ministry or in our own church the testimonies of those amongst us who are overcomers or even strugglers who are still on their journey, if they are willing to testify. Sadly, after my breakthrough in 2018, I have encountered Christians who were hesitant even to rejoice privately with me over what God had done for me by His grace. I felt so dismissed, I felt so shamed in some parts of the church that I was at at that time. I felt shamed and dismissed for deciding to walk with God in my area of brokenness because some would not even rejoice privately with me over the victory that God had given me. Well, let's not do that. On the contrary, let us celebrate our overcomers. Let us celebrate our strugglers' testimony of walking with God, even on this taboo subject, as a demonstration of acceptance in companionship. Lastly, another way to walk the talk that it is safe to come out and come home to God in the body of Christ is to model vulnerability and authenticity ourselves to those who experience same-sex attraction. On modeling vulnerability and authenticity, some Christians have been known to venture as far as admitting to their struggle with chocolates or admitting to their struggle with anger over a driver who cut into their lane on the road that morning. A while ago, I was at a church service overseas, and a pastor there started his sermon by saying this, Church, I want to be vulnerable before all of you today. And after a very dramatic pause, he said, I need to confess to you that I'm scared of public speaking. Now, I do understand that chocolates poor road etiquette and public speaking may be just as huge a monster to some as addiction to gambling, drugs, and sex is to others. But they are not as taboo. They are not as shameful to admit vulnerability and authenticity to. They are not as taboo and shameful as admitting to addiction to gambling, drugs, and sex. I know that it can be a huge risk 
to bear ourselves on more immodest vulnerabilities and authenticity. But if we do so, this will remove the barrier of hesitation, the stigma of shame, the risk of candor, and the, 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 um, the, the possibility of being ashamed, of being shamed by the church that is stifling those who are yearning to come out to someone who wants others to understand their struggle. At a Christian youth leader program a couple of years ago, 20, there were 25 youth leaders participating. The 25 youth leaders were asked the question, do you know someone who experiences same-sex attraction amongst your family or your friends? 23 out of the 25 youth leaders there put up their hand. But when asked the same question, do you know someone who experiences same-sex attraction, but this time in your church, only two of the 25 youth leaders put up their hand. Now, statistically, this kind of difference is extremely unlikely to be reflective of the actual rate of incidence of same-sex attraction in church. It is more likely that we don't know who experiences same-sex attraction in church because they won't tell us about it in church, but they were, are very willing to tell others about it out there in the world, on social media, for example. Why? Because they deem society out there to be a safer place to come out to than even church. And this is very sad because the church is supposed to be the home of compassion, supposed to be the ambassador of redemption that even prostitutes and tax collectors were drawn to Jesus. So one way to address this is to encourage vulnerability and authenticity by our own example so that others know it is safe to come out and come home to God in church. It is safer even than coming out in society. Pastor Ian, the senior founding pastor of the founding senior pastor of my church, and Pastor Joel, our youth pastor of my church, have this these video testimonies on YouTube, which are still there today. And these testimonies are of how they used to struggle with porn addiction even in their early years of serving in ministry. When I first saw these vulnerable testimonies, I did not look down at Pastor Ian or Pastor Joel. Instead, I looked up to them as someone who could really understand me because they were so authentic and vulnerable. Now, of course, you need to figure out your own space of how to address vulnerability and authenticity. But this is a very powerful tool in walking the talk that it is safe to come out and come home to God in the body of Christ. Now, this does not mean that there is no discipleship nor correction in companionship. No, there is a time and a place for correction. Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, convince, rebuke even, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. But such discipleship and correction should be to restore and not to drive away. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So we must be careful to disciple and to correct those with these intentions and not otherwise. So in summary, I would encourage all of us to consider these three handles in understanding what companionship looks like, and we can all walk at this level of companionship. Now, that's C for companionship in cats. A is for answers, meaning be equipped with God's answers, including empirical evidence of research and science and scriptural truths to expose the twisted narrative of the world today that is trapping those who experience same-sex attraction and that is discipling our youth and young adults today so convincingly with trendy hashtags and one-minute TikTok clips. And on answers, we should start by being clear that the attraction in same-sex attraction is not sin, even though the action in same-sex attraction is sin. Le Leviticus chapter 18 does not say, you shall not feel attraction to the same sex, for it is an abomination before God. No, it says you shall not act on the attraction by lying male with a male as with a woman, because that is an abomination before God. The two are not the same. 
experiencing the desire or the temptation that is not of God is not the same as falling for the desire or temptation that is not of God. And we should not lump the two together. For those of us who experience same-sex attraction, as I explained earlier, this attraction is simply a product of the corruption of the fall of mankind. This corruption afflicts all mankind, but just in different ways. But this corruption or this brokenness in itself is not our sin. It is the result of sin, Adam and Eve's sin, but it is not our sin. But how we choose to deal with the corruption or brokenness that we experience can be sin. And on this, many of us who experience same-sex attraction, such as Sean here, such as Philip here, such as Joseph and myself and others, we've all discovered that the answer to fulfillment and wholeness in life is not found in the gay lifestyle, even though we experience the attraction. Even though there is comfort, even though there is considerable pleasure in it, the answer to fulfillment and wholeness in life is not found in the gay lifestyle. The answer is found in walking with God's ways. So by answers, what I mean is to unpack scriptural truths as practical solutions and as liberating all lives to real-life conflicts instead of as a list of do's and don'ts. For example, the world today says, love is love. If you love me, you must celebrate me. No, the Bible's answer is depends on what we are celebrating. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that defines agape love tells us that love does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. So no, Bible agape love does not mean that we must celebrate you in all things in order to prove to you that we love you. Not at all. Companionship under cats does not include celebrating choices that are against the design of God. The Bible shows us what is of God's design that we are to celebrate. But the Bible also shows us what is not of God's design that we are not to celebrate, but that we are to deal with or to address instead. Another example is this. The world today says you are what you feel. No, the Bible's answer is this. Whilst we may not choose the brokenness that we experience and may... And, and therefore, as a result, we may not be able to help how we feel, but we can help what we do with how we feel. You see, despite what we feel, we can choose to align ourselves with God's ways for us and experience the fullness of His abundant life as a victor over how we feel instead of aligning ourselves with how we feel and struggle in confusion and victimhood as a result. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that God has made a way of escape from the things that afflict us. But even when we're equipped with such answers, I encourage us not to be quick to force our answers on others. Not every person who experiences same-sex attraction is looking for answers all the time. And not every person wants us to speak into their lives all the time. Some just want to be heard and understood for now. So let us learn instead to be slow to speak, but swift to hear, as James points out here in this passage. This includes listening to put other people into, ourselves into other people's shoes, rather than filtering our listening to fit other people into our own shoes. We need to do this, because just as none of us here would rush to fill in this answer sheet before we fully understand the questions that we're trying to answer, and just as none of us here would fill in this answer sheet according to what we guess or assume or want the questions to be, neither should we rush to bear down on the gay lifestyle of other people that we see at the tip of this iceberg here before we take the time to understand, for example, the context that is driving them, inducing them, or seducing them to the gay lifestyle that is below the waterline of this picture here. Not every context is the same, so we need to take the time to listen and to understand. And when we listen, we will find very often that a common reason 
that drives guys who experience same-sex attraction to the gay lifestyle, apart from the lure of sexual pleasure, a common reason is loneliness. So it would be incomplete to disciple those who experience same-sex attraction against same-sex relationships, for example, without also processing with them God's answers on loneliness. So what are God's answers on loneliness? Here we have much to learn from Jesus who was single but not lonely. So how did Jesus address loneliness? Well, Scripture tells us that not only did He model out for us intimacy with our Father, He also had community, best friends, and very likely family with Him. On community, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. This means that God designed us for community. Even Jesus had 12 apostles around Him and sometimes 70 other disciples or more too. God also designed us for companionship with best friends. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, two are better than one, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Even Jesus had three best friends around Him. If we're not anchored in community, if we don't have best friends around us, of course we will experience an emptiness. Of course we will feel lonely over this as we miss out on God's design for us. And when I dig deeper with some of those who experience same-sex attraction, whom I minister to, who complain of loneliness, it is actually community. It is actually the deep, intimate bond of best friends that they miss very much and that they feel lonely over. The wrong answer to loneliness here is to jump into a same-sex relationship because the gap is actually that of community or best friends. So at Choices, where we minister to those who experience same-sex attraction, we understand the importance of addressing loneliness. So in the male support group at Choices, where we work amongst those who experience same-sex attraction, we work very much on cultivating deep kingdom friendships. We bond regularly over prayer. We bond over meals, over board games. You gotta follow me. <laughs> over bowling, over rollerblading over escape room, over virtual reality games, over hanging out, and also going on retreats and ministry trips together. It takes this much intentionality and engagement to minister to loneliness. But the deeper question for all of us here is this, would we personally dare to be such a community? Would we personally dare to be such best friends even to someone who experiences same-sex attraction as an answer to their loneliness. When I was growing up, one of my best friends then is Dominic. We hung out a lot together during our teens and early 20s. We were in his bedroom a lot playing computer games and here we were on holiday. Life was less lonely for me then with my best friend Dominic. We were very close, but because I did not want to risk losing him as my best friend, I never told Dominic that I experienced same-sex attraction until a couple of years ago. When I did, this was his reply to me on WhatsApp. He said, you are one of the few close friends who was always there for me through good times and bad. I wish I could have been there for you to support you more as well. I miss our long conversations about everything and nothing. Dominic is straight. These are his two kids here. And he is not even a Christian. Would we Christians dare to be best friends to those who experience same-sex attraction like Dominic still is to me? Are we willing to be part of the answer on loneliness to those who experience same-sex attraction instead of just lecturing them on not going into a same-sex relationship? I said earlier that Jesus showed us how to address loneliness with community, with best friends, and how he also very likely had family with him. Now, in family, do we take the time and make the space to listen to, to respect, and to understand the deepest things of each other, including if someone experiences same-sex attraction, and not be shy, not be ashamed, not be dismissive or rejectful about it? 
last year I was at a gathering of some friends. One of the fathers there brought his 20-year-old son with him. And in front of all of us, he embarrassed his 20-year-old son by asking his son this question. He said, how come you don't have a girlfriend yet? You're not gay, are you? Well, if the son was attracted to the same sex, this would not be the best way to get him to admit it. This would not be the best way to show him that we respect how he feels about it. My younger brother on the right of this photo here is the only one I ever came out to during the decades of my previous gay lifestyle. I came out to him because he would take the time and make the space to listen to, to respect, and to understand the deepest things that I wanted to share with him without judging me and without embarrassing me. Many people presume that in our Asian culture, it is hard to be intimate with family. Others assume that they already know everything about each other and their family. And yet others may be so weighed down by day-to-day -day life that they consider understanding the deepest things about each other in family is an unnecessary luxury. But all of this makes for a poorer experience of life in family. We're not happier by accepting that it is normal to know less about our own family or by intentionally keeping a distance. On the contrary, we are likely to be less sensitive and we are likely to cause and perpetuate unhappiness instead. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, a friend loves all the time, but a brother is born for adversity. Family is meant to be where we do life together. A life shared is a life enriched. A life shared is relationship, and relationship is a deeper experience of life. So will we make the time and the space in family to understand the deepest things of each other, including if someone experiences same-sex attraction and how they feel about it? Life is richer, deeper, and less lonely this way. As family, will we be part of the answer on loneliness to those who experience same-sex attraction? So A is for answers, T is for testimony. And there is great power in testimony as this passage in Revelation points out. Because we get to overcome even the devil himself by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And thank God today we have so many testimonies of overcomers that point to the reality and joy of overcoming by the power of the Holy Spirit. We should not be ashamed to raise awareness of these testimonies. However, we must also not abuse these testimonies to pressurize moderates who are not interested or to pressurize strugglers who are still working their way through. The LGBT activists have accused some pastors, some leaders, and even some parents of turning these testimonies into weapons and attacking those they minister to or their kids with. Hey, if they can do it, why can't you? What's wrong with you? What's your problem? No, we should not do that with these testimonies. That is not what these testimonies are for. These testimonies are to inspire, not to condemn. They're to encourage, not to discourage. They're to lift others to seek God, not to turn them away from God. So let us be careful how we minister these testimonies. Lastly, S is for supplication or prayer. The single most important key for any moderate or struggler is whether they will let God into this part of their lives or not. If they won't let God in, even God cannot help them. And one way we can help here is to pray for them privately. And Paul shows us a very powerful prayer that I would pray privately for others in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 to 26, that God will give them the gift of repentance so that they may know the truth, so that they may come to their senses, and so that they may escape from the snares of the devil. My maid, who is a believer in the center of this photo here, prayed for me privately without me knowing for four and a half years, even when I was bringing different guys home for sex every night. The more she prayed for me, the more guys I brought home for sex. But thank God she did not give up. Her persistent and fervent prayers made a way for God to send me my friend, who told me that he was going to church that Sunday. And her prayers made a way for me to respond to God after that. So I encourage all of us not to dismiss or despise the power of even lonesome prayer. 
I close with this. When Joshua was finally by the city of Jericho in Joshua chapter 5 with the second generation of the children of Israel, a man stood opposite Joshua with a sword drawn on his hand. Joshua asked the man, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Now today, as you navigate the LGBT space, the world out there and the LGBT activists will press you. Are you pro-LGBT or are you against LGBT? Well, the man in Joshua chapter 5 said this, Neither, but I've come as commander of the army of the Lord. Similarly, I encourage all of you today to declare neither, because we are neither pro-LGBT ideology, but then neither are we against LGBT community, but we stand where God stands in this space, where with companionship, answers, testimony, and supplication, we stand for God's alternative answers of truth and grace in this space. We stand for agape love for the LGBT community, agape love where we celebrate truth and not iniquity. As you walk out God's heart here for this community, may God bless you richly in your kingdom journey. I was told by a preacher that blessed is the man Blessed is, blessed is the preacher who keeps to time. Why? Because he will be invited back to speak again. I was given 45 minutes for this sermon. I've only used 40. So I will be invited back again. Praise God. I, I have a question. So we can consume the next five minutes. <laughs> In your sharing because you're a man and you talk about same-sex attraction, can we say that the same principles applies to women who may also be drawn to same-sex attraction? Thank you, Elder Thomas. It's a good question. I was more specifically preaching on same-sex attraction in relation to guys. Girls, same-sex attraction expresses itself in a different way. With guys, a lot of the time, the tendency is sexual desire, physical sexual desire. And so for guys who experience same-sex attraction, the temptation, the lure, the pull of the flesh is in sexual activity. And that's the case a lot of the times with guys. But with girls, same-sex attraction expresses in a different way. For them, same-sex attraction tends to express itself in emotional dependency, emotional attachment. So they get obsessed over their partner or someone that they fall in love with using their own secular language. They get obsessed over them and they can't do life without that other person. So for girls, same-sex attraction expresses itself more in that way than physical sexual activity. So a lot of what I was trying to teach and preach on just now was in relation to guys who are attracted to the physical activity. Um, we do minister to guys and girls separately at Choices, for example, because we understand that it is different what they're going through. So, and the, 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 the way of ministering is also therefore different. Uh, we take a lot more time to deal with emotional dependency for girls, but we take a lot more time to deal with physical sexual addiction with guys. Elder Thomas. You got a question or not? Do you have a question? <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Pastor Chang. He taught in the RIMA module this last few days. And so we are grateful and thankful that this subject is brought to the open and is not sort of kept in secret because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no, no one shame greater to another shame. No doubt humanly, you know, even uh, um, I think it was Apostle Paul who wrote in his, his epistles that when we think back about the sins that we have, we are ashamed. That's, that's, that's for everybody. And I think the gospel invites us to come forward realistically, 
seeking forgiveness and restoration. And when He gives us life, it's not just a better life. It is His life that is in us. Amen.